with some ice cold tea And listen to the Beach Boys when it's just her and me Alright, so I want to welcome everybody to the very aptly named MFA reading at Pivot. Um, Woo! Before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to EXO for including us in the symposium and in their happy hour. Yay! So, cheers to you guys. I was the only one that drank in that cheers, but that's okay. Um, we're going to start with Mr. John Larson with his story, his fiction piece entitled, We. is called We. Uh, I feel like the title wouldn't make a ton of sense with the excerpt I'm going to be reading. Uh, it's a story about a friend of mine who uh, was in an interesting relationship. Um, one of those kind of ones that sort of messes you up for a while. And, uh, she, she went through this thing where she believed that they were two bodies and one spirit and so you started to use the first person plural pronoun to talk about um, herself themselves, right? Um, so that's kind of the serious relationship that they got in was that they had this two-spirit moment. Um, so this is kind of where that starts to happen. Um, it's in longhand, so I hope I can read my own handwriting. Right <laughs> A lot of pressure. Uh, so this is we. Uh, ben was teaching the party how to play a game called Moose. We were all pretty drunk already. Uh, his girlfriend, Kiernan, was asleep on our thrifted easy chair with her shirt off. Uh, I need an ice cube tray. Ben looked to Holly, looked to me. Leslie, ice tray, and a quarter. Someone else found a quarter. I got a plastic ice tray from our freezer. Uh, now dump the ice out. I twisted it hard and the cubes clanged on the inside of our metal sink. Uh, ben took the tray and put it on the coffee table. Uh, I bounced the quarter in the tray. However many cubes back it lands is how many drinks. Uh, left side is I drink, right side is I pick someone else to drink. Um, Holly said, you promised this wasn't another drinking game, um, doing her fake crying thing, cradling her double bottle of Woodbridge Red Blend. Uh, it's not, Ben said, a drinking game. Moose is an alcoholics game. Uh, ben, had, ben had a rough, deep voice in a way that made him sound mad even when he necessarily wasn't. Um, it was invented by the Bolero brothers, Caesar to be exact, on board the USS Indianapolis in 1993 over the Sea of Cortez. It was a game perfected on their third month without so much as seeing land, and it was designed to get a bunch of suicidal alcoholic sailors as drunk as fucking possible. Uh, whenever Ben got drunk like this, he made some story to preface whatever he was trying to get us to do. Usually he claims someone in the Bolero family taught him. Uh, we were all laughing, uh, me, Holly, Emilio, and his girlfriend, and our neighbor, Joanna, Tevin, Clark, um, my boyfriend, Anthony, the people, I didn't, uh, the people I didn't know that had stuck around until two or whenever this was. Um, Kiernan uh, curled up on the recliner, she was laughing too. Uh, it was funny and um, Plus, most of us were all a little scared of Ben. I'm um, speaking for myself, I guess. But he can make you feel like you're made of glass. Uh, Holly, though, she wanted to, she wanted to fuck him. Um, she told me that a few times, uh, joking, but really not. Um, ben said, I'm going to step out. You all can think on whether Moose is your game tonight. Uh, he stood up and got his coat draped in black from head to toe, which was his brand. Um, Holly followed him out for a smoke. Um, we all rubbed our eyes and talked about not being on Ben's level yet. Uh, what a fucking madman. Uh, Emilio called him a doomer. Um, uh, Anthony had his arm around me on the couch. Uh, Kiernan was fetal position again with her ass toward us. Uh, I had dared her to take off her shirt in the last game we played, and she was drunk enough to do it. Uh, I've been plotting on her since, I, since Ben started bringing her around in January. Uh, I didn't know what it would take, like, situationally to get us together, uh, but I knew that I, that I wanted her. Um, I didn't always care about Anthony um, or Ben. Um, I wanted Leslie, that's me, 
uh, and Kiernan in our own little place on the other side of the world. Uh, Holly and Ben played moose when they came back inside uh, while the rest of us drifted off with drinks in our hand um, or wandered home uh, either east or west down the county line 54. Um, when the rest of us found a place we could imagine waking up in, uh, ben and Holly uh, finally went and, and fucked just like she had joked about. Um, after, Ben carried Kieran into the car and drove them home. Um, in the morning, he told her that he demanded an open relationship, uh, take it or leave it. So she took it. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> up next, we have the man very greatly dressed in the MFA creative writing sweatshirt. Mr. Zeke Perkins with his story in San Francisco. It's not really the title. I don't have a title for this story. So I was working on it today. <laughs> Ellen and I met at the Esalen Institute in the summer of 2016 and spent two months together. In September, she went back to San Luis Obispo for her last year of college, and I stayed on as a grounds worker. With her gone, we stayed together. One Friday in October 2016, she drove up in her Jeep and stayed in the loft of my split-level dwelling, another month-long employee of the retreat center sleeping below us on the first floor. There was a free concert in San Francisco the next day, and we planned on going together. Standing outside my door, she cocked her hip to the side, casually, and smiled. She wore yoga pants and an orange fleece, which more or less matched her copper eyes. Once inside, she told me that her period was just starting, and we went upstairs and had sex. Afterwards, she turned petulant. We went back to my porch and looked over the redwoods toward the Pacific Ocean. We stared at each other's midsections. Going off her bad mood, I began to feel twisted. In the past, she said things to men which I felt humiliated me, and I thought of them now. She was turned away from me with her hands on the flaking wood porch railing. I found the underwear, she said to the darkening blue sky. What underwear? I was confused. She turned and walked back inside without a word, and I followed her. My mom had stayed with me the weekend before and accidentally left it in the corner of my room. Oh, she said when I explained, almost as, as if disappointed. Well, this is funny, I said, crouching in the loft space next to my mattress, which sat directly on the floor, holding my mother's underwear awkwardly in one hand. Elle sat on the mattress and looked at me. It'd be my mom's and all. A psychoanalyst would have a field day, I said, dropping the cotton garment. Yeah, with you, they definitely could. The first time Elle and I talked about feelings with the hot springs at Esalen. We were both naked, and she got in a ceramic tub with me. Her breasts floated in the sulfur water, and her legs brushed against mine. She told me how she'd shown interest in another kid at the retreat center, but that he jilted her. Then she dropped her head under this water for a moment. And when she emerged, as if from that memory, she said that she was attracted to me. Do you feel that as well, she asked. In the morning, I drove us in her Jeep to San Francisco. On, re on Route 1, mist rolled in like low-lying clouds, the sun occasionally burning through. Even from the far lane, the sheer drop to the Pacific frightened me. I reached across the distance of the seats, rubbing Elle's knee or pressing her hand. I did it even when it felt like too much, even when I didn't want to. I was compulsed, subterraneanly afraid, that she might float up and out of the Jeep, glide out into the Pacific, afraid that I'd suddenly burst and tell her I was bored with her, even though I wasn't, afraid I'd jealously berate her and she'd drop me out of her Jeep before driving up to San Francisco on her own. We fought over music and, agree and could agree only on Frank Ocean, thinking about you, self-control. I picked up her iPhone, corded to her Jeep, and played Modest Mouse. I miss you when you're around. Her skin, the color of a Bosch pear, her smell, dank, in the Jeep, like something comfortable with its own stewing. When that song ended, she leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. In order to get free parking, we had to put the Jeep a far walk from the festival in Golden Gate Park. We were close to the beach and the streets were whitewashed. She was wearing the summer dress I liked, the color of a lime but not lime green, and wool leg warmers for the wind. Her cramps started in earnest. She placed a hand on her stomach and took tiny glacial steps. On the path to the park, People looked at her and then at me with concern. Had I punched her in the gut, drugged her? I felt guilty. 
Eventually, I lifted her onto my back and carried her for the last half mile. When we could see banners in the stage, I tapped her leg and slowly placed her feet back on the asphalt path. She stopped, stepped shoulder to shoulder with me, and for a moment, neither of us moved, taking in the crowd and the stage and all of its multicolored, flashing glory. And she began to cry. Her college friends were out there somewhere to the right of the stage, one of them said through text. I was vaguely intimidated by this life she had that didn't include me. Imagine as a gaggle of lanky, long-haired man-boys who pawed at her day and night. Next to me, she was basically convulsing in pain. Neither of us were ready to face the music. Some 200 yards before them, we sat down on a hill facing away from the stage and toward the setting sun, the thumping from speakers pulsing through our backs. It feels like I'm having a baby, she said. I smiled. I'm sorry. I moved to sit behind her and held around her arms. It was getting cool. I could feel goosebumps. After the concert, we ate, a t we ate at a Thai restaurant and went to her Jeep. Neither of us liked the bands that played, but her friends were nice. Over dinner, an invitation had been extended to stay at someone's parents' house in Marin County. Sated from green curry under the shadowy yellow light of street lamps in the Jeep, I told her I loved her, and she said she loved me too. My hand was shaking in the seat between us. Something like the tell of a gambler. Not that I had a clue what I was telling. Do you feel better with having said that, she asked. Yes, I think so. I feel like we've finally done something. She laughed, and I laughed too. For a while, we were quiet. Then we started driving before either of us could change our minds. All right, up next we have Isabel Johnson reading what is now an excerpt of If You Feed It, It Will Come Back. As Jeremy said, this is an excerpt. This is a story um, about a harpy that lives in a forest, but she's not in this part at all. So just imagine it working. <clears throat> there it was, a little caterpillar sunk down to the bottom of the saltwater pool. Macy sighed. She had just skimmed the thing yesterday. It was monarch season. The guys were everywhere, making their slow arches across her yard, eating up her garden decorating the bottom of her pool with corpses. Macy squinted at the puffy scribble underneath the water of the very far deep end, rippling gently with the water's movement. She rolled up her jeans and tentatively thrashed her foot in the water to see if it would come unstuck. It didn't. She had failed physics anyway. As she went to get the long-handled brush to unstick the caterpillar, she caught a glimpse of her husband through the living room window, watching cartoons with Celia. From the way his back moved, she could tell he was sneaking spoonfuls of their daughter's cereal. She had known for a while. Celia had snitched during bath time. Daddy says my cereal is better, she had said, as if remarking about the weather. She was four, or about to be, a good, earnest age. Secrets flopped out of her mouth at a very young vintage. Does he now? Uh-huh, I share with him. Celia had flopped an arm in the soapy water, which was growing tepid and streaked with deflated bubbles, and that was it. Macy knocked on the window. Greg jumped and then turned. A rivulet of pastel milk dribbled down his chin. He smiled and jostled Celia, who momentarily ripped her eyes from the TV to smile and wave. Hi, Macy mouthed. Her husband mouthed it back and then blew her a kiss, streaking the mess across his face. Macy would have liked to have been charmed or disgusted, but instead she was still just frustrated about the pool. Macy liked her husband, but she no longer loved him. Or maybe that's what love was six years into a marriage, liking someone a whole lot, enough to keep things the way they are, and then, just maybe, the way things are will change. Maybe it was like the part of Splash Mountain where you're in the tunnel, past the animatronics, right before the good part. Or the caterpillar, fat on leaves, slowing down and crusting over. Eventually, there could be a butterfly. This was something she would have thought a lot about, except that Celia's birthday party was, mercifully, taking up all of her headspace. Celia had asked for a princess party, no specific princess from a movie, though they had asked. So, a nondescript princess? Greg had said into her ear, where they were snuggled on the couch under the same blanket. His downy leg hairs tickled her ankle. 
a show about baking through a rainbow of color onto Greg's bulky shoulder. Generic brand? She had laughed so hard it felt like her throat was closing. He had always made her laugh. That was part of why they made such a good team. Maybe it was unsustainable to be constantly radiating love. Even fireflies had to blink off. Thank you. Well, it was perfect timing at the door. Yeah. <laughs> that was my ride. I gotta go. That was like, yeah. <laughs> Time when it reached. All right, next up we have uh, Jessica. And I'm sorry, Jessica, but I'm going to butcher your last name. So I'm just not even going to say it. Uh, with their story, Walking, or Waking, excuse me, Wonderland. Um, all right, well, thanks for indulging me and letting me uh, read with you all this evening. That's really generous. Um, so this is a couple poems from a collection that I've been working on once upon a time when I was still doing this sort of thing more seriously. Um, so I'm trying to remind myself of that's still a thing. Um, this first one's called I Can Blame No One But Myself. When you leave me hanging upside down, tethered and bled, conveniently, it may appear near humane. The judges in those cases tend toward haziness. So when asked, they too cannot speak of the imminent compulsion to cut me into tasty parcels so that you may eat me in my death more methodically than you drink of me in life. Okay, so on the lighter side of the collection, <laughs> uh, potions and cake. One, it is disconcerting when one finds oneself too much one way and not another when one must absolutely be another to get in. And then again, to become rather troublesome, it becomes rather troublesome when one goes in reverse, and now, being considerably another way, on the right size, finds the door locked, only to realize upon looking up, she must again be one way to retrieve the little golden key. It is no wonder she cried so much, having shrunk so small and grown so big, and still nowhere closer to the other side of the door all because the instructions failed to mention proportion effects. Though just because a note reads, drink me or eat me, does not mean drink all of me or eat all of me, and surely not all at once, or else one might become stuck being one or another way altogether. Two, had she been less distraught, she might have wondered at the point of ever, of ever having been one way than another, only to become one way again, yet still different than how she began. But pressed and troubled as she was, she merely took the rabbit's drop gloves and fan and asked, who am I then? Having no answer, she sobbed. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody get settled in. And I'm just gonna like let you sit there and fester for a moment. <laughs> All right, next up we have Hagen Smith with Joyride. <laughs> um, so the only thing that you really have to know about um, the sex work is that it takes place in the lead up to the last presidential election, and the uh, the narrators in a like a bad frame of mind, basically. Um, Mackenzie's apartment wasn't heated and it was somehow colder inside. We sat on the floor and wrapped around each other and I said, Mac? Yeah, she asked. I think I'd like to go to church sometime. She peeled off me. An atheist from Hanover, why wouldn't she? But I wasn't religious either and I hugged her. I had this replacement faith that I might share what I needed to share by touching through a sustained, tactful love. I held her and went way inside my head. I remember this vision of a theater curtain rolling back, a blacked out audience howling their laugh track at me. Awful. Awful. I almost started sweating. Like, look, Mackenzie, 
don't live away. Please get me. And maybe she did. It's impossible to say, isn't it? I told her I'd visit the Sufis in Whirl if that's what was nearby. And she said she'd actually been to a church in Chapel Hill before. Unitarian Universalist. So we went that Sunday. The yards off Franklin Street were fading, and the town scrolled by like fields of asphodel. A weak sun breaking through. The churches I'd been raised in were little abject things. Shoe boxes that floated away with floods. This place was a cathedral by comparison. Mackenzie whispered in my ear as I pulled literature out of the pew in front of us and read illustrious history. The Founding Fathers, Deist and Theist. She thought it was awesome that anybody could be a Unitarian Universalist. You could believe in anything. She said you don't even have to believe in God. I said, what? And then the priest, with a green sash hung over his neck, told me to rise. Fifteen minutes later, I was regretting having come. Maybe this is me showing my pale white ass, but politics as religion is just not my thing. It was weird to hear this young priest, pastor, whatever he was, I think you could call him whatever you wanted to call him, standing up there between skinny windows and making sure we got out to protest the bathroom bill. The congregation was a bunch of white-headed boomers wearing keds and hiking boots, and they nodded and said things with a directed admonition. I wondered, is this my higher power? Is this what I should surrender to if I want the ability to understand and be understood in turn? I slightly turned my head. Mackenzie seemed to be receiving what I'd hoped to receive, some warm spirit that fluxed under the tile and fortified her to fight another day. At a certain point, the priest stepped away from the dais, and a small bobcut woman dawdled to the altar below and picked up a small, dark stone. She faced us and started talking. I presumed it was a new entry in a saga about her partner, still getting it out through chemo. Her voice caved in and snapped back. When she was done, she dropped the stone into a large fishbowl on the altar and went to her pew. Then someone else came up, took a stone, and told their story. Dropped the stone in the fishbowl with a solitary clack. This was the ritual. One man talked about his son, addicted to heroin, three trips to rehab and no good. He tried giving him a place to stay, but every day he came home and found something gone the silverware, the TV. I don't want to call the law on my own son, he says. He's sobbing by the time he drops his stone and goes away. He doubles over when he sits down and someone rubs his back. I hear about foot pain, deceased friends who reveal themselves through numbers and rainbows, solace in getting our first female president, pharmaceutical trials, and machines with unprecedented precision. One of them says, I want to live, damn it and the weak defiance unnerves me. Several more retirees haul themselves up and camp to the stones. When I was certain no one else would go, I got up and made my way down. I couldn't even look at Mackenzie. I kept my head lowered until I saw the white tablecloth, the stones laid out, took one in my right hand. It was cold and smooth. All right, next up we have Kaylin Rose with her two poems. Yes. Midnight Glories and Open Field. Okay, Midnight Glories after John Armstrong's Dreaming Head, which is temper paint on wood. That night I made love to the mountain. My arms, bare arms. My hands, bare claws. I tore at the meat, the bones of granite below. I got into that very dust as deeply as I could go, and I laid my body up against it in a fevered rush for consummation. I needed it to enter me. And this is um, Open Field. To avoid calling him and calling off the breakup, I called you. You read me something over the phone in a British accent as I walked across the field carrying bags of just uprooted vegetables. I protected them from exposure. I shaded them from the blaze in the sky while my desire walked naked through the wheat. All 
All right, next up we have Omeria Pratt with a sadly named piece called Dead Armadillos. <laughs> start from kind of the middle. Uh, so backstory, uh, uh, Desi is returning home after two years uh, following a breakup uh, before she heads uh, back up to New York City. Um, at the same time, her mother has left uh, a marriage, which was her third marriage, after 20 years and has moved to Las Vegas. And now her mother is just sort of uh, wandering the West Coast. Um, the relationship was abusive. Um, their house that they owned is a wreck. Her stepfather is um, a hoarder. And uh, Desi doesn't know how to feel about her stepfather now that that relationship has ended. Um, so I, I will start with, uh, she is at one of her sister's house um, and she's arriving there. Um, it had briefly rained when I arrived at Tasha's place around nine that night. The rain shower cooled the air and the wet gravel crunched and popped beneath my car tires. Uh, Francis's old Acura was parked out front. I smelled something cooking on the grill and saw a light coming from her backyard. A few children were playing around a big tree that sat in the middle of the yard, its branches reaching over the roof. Uh, they were playing hide and go seek because a little girl with beads in her hair, no more than six, hid behind the tree and peeked out at the seeker. She looked toward me and smiled as I pulled up. Her missing front teeth gleamed in my headlights. It was Kiara. She came over to my car on the passenger side and rested her chin up on the door to look inside. Her tiny fingers rummaged through the open gloved compartment. You got candy, she asked. She didn't wait for me to answer. She opened the door and hopped inside. What's your name? Desi, your aunt Desi. I was looking for, uh, through the stash of travel snacks I had in the black gas station bag for a packet of spearmint gum I bought earlier. I pulled out a couple of pieces and gave it to her. You mama's sister, I know you live in NYC. She opened both pieces of gum and smashed them into her mouth. Not soon after that, other little girls that were once playing in the yard surrounded my car. Someone lifted a baby, about one or two years old, and I had to grab her and place her in my lap, or else the tiny hands holding her would have dropped her on the gravel. <laughs> her thick black hair grew out of her head and was unkempt like mine. She had large brown eyes and she held on to me as if she'd known me the, this whole time. Five little faces rested their chins on my car, looking inside on their tiny, on um, their tiptoes. I passed around the gum until it ran out. I had none for the baby, but she wasn't begging. She just looked at me and smiled occasionally. Her face mimicked my confused reaction. Frances came out of the house and waved to me. Get your ass out of that car, she yelled. She had a cup in her hand. She laughed and told the girls to move. They all ran to the back of the house without the baby. She was still in my lap, still looking at me with wide eyes, studying the sparring thing holding her, perhaps. She got out of the car, uh, we got out of the car, and I held her on my head. Gibbs, Francis said, stumbling down the steps. You look just like a Gibbs. She called me by my last name when we were kids, and it didn't make sense until I cut my hair. I looked just like my father. I had his nose, his tall stature, his dark brown skin, his gap tooth. The three of us looked like our fathers more so than our mother, which is to say we carried different last names like a reminder or a piece of something broken. Drink that, Francis handed me the cup she was holding. It was sweet, like strawberry syrup, and bitter tasting at the end. A chunk of ice got caught in my throat. I coughed it back up. Punk. Francis slapped my back. Surprise, I said. How long are you here for? Francis took the cup from me and continued drinking. Just for tonight, thought I'd check in. The baby was on my hip, played with, played with the collar of my shirt, and tried to pull at my afro. I swatted her hand away. She swatted back at me. Uh, you checked and we're good. Francis was standing right in front of the screen door and the only glimpse I got from inside was of people moving about. A faint sound of music, what I could make out was a single verse, something like baby, 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 some celebration. What's the occasion, I asked. When did you start talking like that? Francis took the baby from me. This is Sierra, looks just like you, right? Tasha was pregnant the last time I came home, but no one told me until the baby was born. No one had ever told me much of anything about the family. Is Tasha around? Frances nodded. She said she was in the back. You hungry, Skinny? We both had lost weight a few years ago. 
but Frances gained all her weight back after losing the job at the hotel she worked at for 15 years. I knew this because it was the only time she had called me for money, the only time one of my sisters needed me for anything. Frances poked my stomach, pinched my arms, asked me how I kept it off. She had been heavier most of her life, all of us had, putting on weight as we grew into adolescence. I hid my body as a teen and wore oversized hoodies and the same two pairs of jeans, one of them with the zipper broken, a shoestring sewn in place of it. Even still, I masked a part of myself into adulthood, and, into adulthood, and at the age of 30, I had finally made a commitment to look more masculine. It smells good, I said. We didn't hug. Frances took the baby from me, led me through the house. Uh, Tasha had lived in it with her three children for two years, but the place was barely furnished uh, since the last time I saw it. Two leather armchairs sat in the middle, the material torn and showing the yellow foam underneath. A flat screen sat on the floor, and an old playpen full of toys was tucked behind the chairs. There were about 10 people in the house, mostly gathered uh, in the kitchen surrounding the table. Cigarette smoke covered the kitchen, a glossy wall of it thickening the air surrounding the face, nearly blurring my vision. I knew hardly anyone, though all, they all seemed to know me. A string of hay desis came out of each pocket of the table. An older man playing his hand in a card game, a young woman sitting on top of the cooler. A woman with thick coiled hair dried, uh, dyed, thick coiled hair dyed red popped the tape into the old stereo and said, look at baby girl. I blushed. My nephew, tall and dark skinned, appeared through the blur of the smoke. His eyes still smiled at me. Hey auntie. Devin said and then handed me a Bud Light. I took it from him and slapped his arm. You shouldn't be drinking. He laughed and gave me a hug. Devin was 22 then. But in my mind, he would always be 13. The two of us playing basketball in the driveway, the only friend I had, I witnessed that it's been brought home as a newborn when I was six. The last thing I cherished and missed about High Point. Before I could say anything, he had disappeared somewhere inside the house. I dodged the rest of the familiar strangers and found Tasha on her back deck porch in front of the grill flipping flank steaks. Her hair was cut shorter than what I remembered and she was barefoot standing on the wet deck. Tasha had always liked to go barefoot outside. You met baby girl out front, Tasha asked without taking her eyes off that fat piece of steak she was flipping over. Sierra looks just like you. She grabbed her beer that was resting beside the grill and took a low, uh, long swig. My oldest sister, a bad sleeper and a heavy drinker. Tasha could drink the six pack in one night and be up for a six o'clock shift at the nursing home with hardly a complaint. The dark circles under her eyes were new. The concern in her face when she saw me was not. What's the celebration, I asked. No celebration, we're just hungry. Tasha looked at me and after putting the steak to rest. She uh, slapped my head. How long you gonna be here for this time? Just for the night. You see your daddy yet? She laughed at this. You know he's not my daddy. Tasha grabbed the plate with the cooked uh, piece of steak on it and took uh, my hand um, and told me to uh, bring it to the people inside. I walked over to the sliding gas door opened it and let the sounds of laughter and music spill out. For a moment it was like I was on another planet with an unfamiliar language. I have forgotten how my people sound in a uh, celebration. All right, next up we have Ash Baker. I'll take the camera from you. <laughs> uh, with their story, Self-Defense for Girls with Small Hands. as well. Short stories are just too long. Okay. <laughs> Lucy was taught as a little girl that men were after her, that they paid attention to what she wore and the way she walked. She was taught to button her linen shirts to her clavicle and always to take a partner to the girl's bathroom. Lucy knew to keep her knees together when she wore a dress or a skirt and always to wear something underneath just in case. She'd been in big trouble one Sunday when she'd gone to church and made it all the way home in her denim jumper dress without panties. Her mother had gasped when she caught a glimpse of her rear as Lucy climbed into bed with, to nap with Hoppity, her pink stuffed rabbit. Where are your panties, she'd said. Lucy had shrugged, her ears growing hot, and she was sent immediately to her father for a spanking. After hearing what had happened, he shook his head and told Lucy to bend over and raise her jumper. Lucy could hear her mother in the hall telling her twin brother Adam to mind his own business. We've taught you better, her dad said, before swatting her bare ass three times with the flat end of a yardstick. When he was finished, Lucy sat down on the bed. 
Her mother sat down next to her and ran her long, thin fingers through Lucy's hair. It was true. Lucy was more than taught. Every night, Lucy would crouch on the floor on her knees with her father and Adam and train. If he grabs you like this, Lucy's dad would say, the collar of her shirt balled in his strong fists. What then? Lucy slowly mimicked the motion they'd shown her before. Her fingers curled into fists and shoved through the gap between his thick, hairy arms. The force, when executed at full speed, would theoretically loosen his grip on her collar. Then she'd box his ears with her knuckles. What then? Lucy's dad asked. Every exercise ended the same way, but Lucy's dad made her repeat the words even though Lucy knew them by now. Run toward light, toward people, and scream as loud as possible. Lucy was taught never to scream unless it was an absolute emergency. When their parents weren't around, sometimes Adam would give Lucy Indian burns or a nice smack on the head. Lucy knew she couldn't scream, else her parents would come running down the hall worried something terrible had happened. Once Adam flipped Lucy with a rubber band, and Lucy was so angry she jumped on his back, pounded her fist into his ear, and let out a great squeal. Her mother rushed into the room with tears in her eyes, and after splitting up the fight, Lucy was sent to her father for a spanking. Sometimes, out of nowhere, Adam would spook Lucy from behind, pinning her arms to her sides. It was a game. He'd pin her, she'd get loose. He taught her to slam her weight towards the floor, loosening his grip, and to grab one of his legs and pull, making him fall to the ground. Most of the time, that was the extent of the exercise. Sometimes, though, Adam would be in a stranger mood. Lucy could recognize these moods by the way Adam would laugh. When she'd pull his leg to make him lose his balance, instead of letting go, Adam would only squeeze tighter and pull her to the ground with him. He'd move to another position for her to twist out of. Her flat on the floor, on her stomach, his knee digging into her spine, while he pulled her arms back as if ready to hog tie her. She'd flail her legs, trying to kick his head, but he always knew how to avoid getting hurt. It came naturally to him. He'd laugh and growl at her. What now, Lucy, what now? Once, when they were at a friend's house, Adam took Lucy to the basement and locked her in their dog's crate. Lucy giggled at first until Adam secured the crate's door with a jump rope. Hey, it's not funny, Lucy said. Adam slid the crate, Lucy banging the wire with her fists into a musty stool closet and barred the door with an axe. He turned the lights off, tiptoed back up the stairs and locked the basement door. At first, Lucy shouted for Adam or their friend, but after what felt like a year, no one came. She fell through the dark until she found the ends of the jump rope, forced her small hands through the gaps in the crate to untie them. Because Adam had shoved the crate, the door of the crate snug against the wall, Adam had to heave her whole body against the opposite side until she created some space, knocking down a rake and a hoe with her force. She felt for the locks of the crate and lifted them, one at a time, twisting and pulling until they gave way. The door only opened up a few inches, but she pushed against the wall and pried herself through, the wires sticking against her skin. She didn't realize until Adam returned after another hour and unbarred the closet door that she was bleeding. Thanks. All right. Next up we have Rocky with Gotta Be a Man. Len stared at the gun. He kicked his bedroom door closed to the line with the jam. He could smell the usual fragrance of his home, bacon spitting on a pan and breathing out a wind of smoke that was carried to his room. He imagined the rest, his mother wiping the grease stains on the canvas of her apron, and with clean hands taking the jam jars and the margarine and lathering the puff dough of the biscuits till they were glutted full. In the middle of the table, he imagined a pitcher of milk frothed to the mouth, and on a plate, a few slabs of ham. Len liked that familiar smell, and while he rolled the gun through his weathered palms, he thought how nice it was to eat her food and talk to her across a splintered table, as his younger siblings ate sloppily and scrunched their faces in shame when she scorned them for it. His father had died in a coal mine explosion when he was a young boy. Len, now 17, took on the tasks his father never had the chance to teach him. When Len was seven, just after his father's death, his mother took him across their land to a man tanned like leather and flashing a grin that was short of teeth. 
The man was dressed in stiff overalls buckled over a worn blue shirt. Len recognized him as the neighbor who lived on the farm adjacent to theirs. He was standing beside the barn with a frayed bag of feed. This is Mr. Potter, Lenny, his mother said. He looked up at the strange man and choked out a soft hello. The man's voice strained in a strange holler. You ever tend to these animals, he asked, pointing into the barn at the livestock his mother had been struggling to take care of in the days following his father's sudden, sudden passing. His pa didn't show him, Len's mother answered for him. The man chuckled and then coughed so hard he shook. Eyes crossed and spittle hanging as a string on his lip, he spoke again. Well, now's his time to learn. Len's dark eyes bulged at his mother. She looked stern but said sweetly, It's your job to take on now, Lenny. You gotta be a man. Though the strange man made Len uneasy, he came, he came every day for the next month, walking down the gravelly roads and through the hills to the remote land, just as sunrise bleached the sky. Len spent all day learning to milk the cow, tend to the laying hens, feed the pigs, and his least favorite part, slaughter them all. With every pool of blood spilled before his feet, he felt the shameful urge to sacrifice his own life in lieu of theirs. By spring, the strange man told Len he wouldn't be coming back anymore because Len had learned enough to continue on his own. He was glad the man would be gone, but he didn't leave right away. He went to his wagon and brought back a shotgun. If all your keep dies, you'll leave this for hunting. Len took the gun and stared wonderingly at the two rough barrels and the shined wood of the stock with small birds carved on its side. Len tried to refuse it, telling the man he had given enough, but the man just chuckled and replied, That was your pause. It's all yours now. The gun weighed heavy in Len's hands and made him scared. He took it out to the empty shed and left it there so it would be forgotten. Len went on, growing until he reached six feet. While staring at his hands now, large and rough as they broke a chicken's neck, he realized he didn't know when it was his, cha his hands changed, or even if he had ever noticed before. He didn't know when his voice deepened or his hair flourished or his height grew. And as the necks of the chickens left bursts of blood staining his cracked, dusk dusted skin, he did not feel like he was truly a man. Len walked from the house to the field every day in the morning to feed the animals and let them out into the pasture. As night fell, he would return home with eggs, milk, or meat. His mother looked lovingly on at him, though the indistinct nature of his charcoal eyes always made him look so hardened. She tried to talk to him and often baked him extra sweets, but he never softened. He, wo he woke and worked, but spoke little. His mother said nothing about it and displayed her love by washing and setting out his clothes and cooking large meals. Not much made him happy in life, but he always felt at ease when the smell of her food had filled the house. But the food couldn't, couldn't keep the nightmares away. Len often woke, sweating and panicked in the middle of the night. In those dreams, he saw himself drifting towards the shed and taking the gun over and over again. One day, he woke up and it was beside him. He sat and smoothed his finger around the crescent trigger. He shoved his mouth full with a bitter barrel and looked on, ready but scared, his dark eyes squeezing out fat tears. Then he heard his mother. Lenny, food's ready. I set aside some sweet bread for you. He appeared at the table and ate quietly. His mother noticed the soft sadness drowning his eyes. She took his hand and said, I'm going to plant some berries in the summer. You'll have more jam than the whole world. The corners of his mouth pulled and she caught a spark of smile in his eyes. Len laughed after dinner. He snuck out with the gun when his mother had gone to sleep. The air stirred with gunshots as he killed and gathered animals in the woods. He walked back with their bodies strung across his shoulders and gutted and skinned them, ready to cook for morning. All right, so up next is who I've heard, uh, the most prolific poet out of Indiana, which would be me. That joke didn't really land as well as I wanted it to, but that's okay. Um, so I've got two poems. This first one is um, Dear Father, June 2016. El Pastor calls it Vida de Asencia y Soledad. The interpreter's translation is closer to Vida sin Cristo. And maybe you understand a life without Christ is indeed absent and lonely, so you nod in agreement. My translation is closer to disassociation and depression. 
Do you interpret that as weakness? I expect you to quote the Bible. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. What I never say is, God made me this way. I am a sundew. You are a calla lily. That is to say, you are righteous and pure, and hugging you still feels unnatural. Maybe El Pastor meant the opposite of invisible is the privilege to choose not to see. And the next one is uh, called Carved by Glaciers. Indiana's high point overlooks nearly level cornfields. Like any other place in the state, crops are visible for miles on a clear day. Thousands of stalks swing dancing in the wind, flaunting green dresses. The glaciers crawled here, sculpting the, st- the stone and dirt into shapeless statuettes. I was sculpted too, from the soil, like a holy man of Eden. I drank from the glacial lake for its knowledge, and it tasted sweeter than an apple. Thank you. Um, Up next is Angel with Reflection and Swing. Everybody in this room, and yet I'm still very nervous. <laughs> Memory begins like this. Around the time my hair started wiring into rope, the man with rape on his breath calls for absolution. Bourbon stains the same as stark blackness against a bluegrass backdrop. A meeting of mouths, brightened by Times Square's glow and summer bustle, coming as much as crying for equatorial women. I carve a colored girl's lyric into my arm. A month later, it becomes an epitaph. Etch an ampersand into the undergrowth of vines, sputter a moon on the ache of my footfall. Practice meditation in the low hum of spine-trailed kisses and black breaking through blinds. Turn the tub to a baptismal pool. Steep lavender and rose, sip cheap wine and scalding tea to commune. Slide fingers through the slick of sweat in the basin between breasts. Choke myself awake with nightmares of swallowing the blade under my tongue. Expose raw esophagus to a father. I pretend it was dead the last four years. Therapist says, I'm a bucket masquerading as a basket. Catching and carrying severed organs as if they are gifts. I confess it was her trusted teenage hands that unearthed my seedling sex. Aunt asks if I am gay as a result of the truth and my telling it. Learn new tongues, shauna and sucking. Bridle them between heartbreaks and sobbing storms. Recount each moment. Realize the world has rotated again. And I am still here, trying. on the complete opposite end of that uh, (laughs) spectrum. (laughs) This is a poem from My Thesis in Progress, which many of you know is a collection of persona poems set in the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. It's called Swing. Jazz, tastes like hot grits on a holiday called Sunday, thick with the promise of glory, butter smooth as the baby savior and pleasing to the soul. Feels like scrap iron hooch scatting through veins, shabbat wee by now, making art of a staggered two-step. Forgotten feet and a snatch of belief in flying. Smells like musk oil and honeysuckle, dabbed behind an ear tuned for flat sharp chords, and inside a wrist, cocked to anchor staccato snaps. Looks like rose red bulbs vining from the ceiling, grooved floorboards from gut foot stomping, Jagged auburn brick and polished brass. Sounds like roaring sighs and purring moans. Locomotives on grease slick rails, a cock crowing to anoint the dawn. Jazz is a savory concoction seasoned with skin swatches and spare ribs. Grinding treble, high-fiving bottom floor bass. The pant of the heaviest hound. The stubble shadow on a chiseled chin. The tilt of a headed wool hat. The sootiest hour before day breaks. 
black. Thank you. All right, next up we have Michael McEwen with Adam Briefly. Hello. Uh, I guess what you need to know from this story is that the character named Adam is married to a woman named Miriam, and they have a son whose nickname is Benji. Uh, a week later, on Tuesday, I was making dinner when I got a text from Adam to say he was coming into town to send some packages through the post office. I took a shower while the eggplant was baking and nearly set the whole apartment on fire. The stench made my stomach tight. I picked away the black and crisp and tried in vain to eat some of the hot guts of the vegetable. I left windows open and fans running when I locked up to head downtown at 8. We met up at the Oakmar Motel for a beer. Some older men with slicked hair were shouting and slapping the bar. We sat at the end where the wood was still sticky from maple syrup that morning. Is Benji ready to move? I think so, Adam said. He started saying bit, but he means pit. Are you ready? He shrugged. I'm just here, he said. Miriam's the one looking at schools and programs and shit all. I'm just here. I guess so. We drank our beers. It'll be a nice city, though. I hear it's shit and rust. I shook my head. How many Steelers fans around here never even seen it? You love it so much, you move in with us. Set you up in the closet. That way when Miriam gets pissed, she'll have something to smack. He twisted around to get his wallet. Of course, we won't be living in much more than a closet. Outside, the air was wet and the sky was turning dark. A ceiling of clouds was lying so thick across the town, it looked like a blanket was coming down on us. It reminded me of lying in bed at home, trying to sleep, rubbing my pajama knees against my comforter until it made static. Want to walk? We took a long route around town, pulling into our coats, squeezing fists until they were warm. We climbed up to the overlook and spotted my apartment in the print shop. The town looked like a toy set from up there. By then, the horizon was gone in the dark. Where it should have been, a string of red lights beamed, then went out. There were windmills in the far mountain calling out to pilots. We wandered back to my apartment, and I let him in for a minute. Jesus, Adam said, pinching his nose. I turned the fan toward the windows, but the stink didn't vanish. In the kitchen, he noticed the print on the fridge. Rocky hadn't taken it. He opened the fridge and lit up in the yellow glow. Any beer? We could smoke, I said. He looked at me. Where do you have work in the morning? I do. He closed the fridge. Don't you? Just a little bit, I said. I pinched out a bowl and we passed it in the living room. When everything got rounded edges, I turned on cartoons. We laughed at anticipating jokes and tried putting on music while we watched. He kicked me and I kicked him back and then he leaned over and shoved me into the side of the couch, his face buried in my neck. I pressed my lips against his cheek and looped my fingers through his hair. I thought I wanted to cry. He pounded my chest with his fists and then slid down and unbuttoned my pants. Stop, I said. The room stopped spinning and the TV got loud again. Are you okay? His hand moved carefully between my zipper. I watched him, my thighs frozen. Looping my arm around his neck, I kept his forehead pressed against mine and finished immediately. Then we lay still. The cartoons were still playing. I couldn't get a full breath and kept trying, but the burned eggplant blocked my nostrils, my throat. I imagined my lungs inflating like grocery bags caught in the wind, but they never filled. His phone lit up with Miriam's name, and I jumped up and ran to the bathroom. I hadn't noticed how filthy the sink was. I rubbed hairs together in a tissue. I wiped the mirror with lemon something and dug out the grout above the sink. When I came back out, Adam was wearing his jacket, so I drove him home. Rain was pattering on the sidewalks when we left, and he jumped out of the car the moment I put it in park. You be around this week? No, I said. I don't know, maybe I'll come over one night, bring some beer. I drove home through dull sheets of rain. I guess it happened like that. Weekends I spent with Rocky, exhausted, going to the farmer's market, buying our puzzles and trinkets. Even though I was so destitute, my fridge was usually empty by midweek. We made pizza or helped mom arrange the stones around her trailer-side spice garden. Or Rocky told me about stars and pulsars. I nodded my head and acted surprised when she wanted me to, knowing that was just another way of lying. Weekdays, I threw myself into my work, anxious to get jobs done before someone fired me, before one of the other men saw a message from Adam on my phone, before I pushed my head under the iron cutter. I could hold the world together if every letter was stamped perfectly on the label. At least once a week, 
and would make up a reason to be in town and I'd find it, sometimes already high. We walked, we made figure eights of town, buying milkshakes at McDonald's or beers at the Oak Mar. We talked about getting a house in Montreal and having me teach Benji how to screen print his own clothes for school. We never got very far. Then we came back to my room, closed the door and smoked. We'd get so high that it didn't matter what we were doing because it was unfolding in real time. His hand in the back of my neck, the smallness of his mouth when I bit his lip. When they moved to Pittsburgh, I told myself I wasn't afraid that he was shrinking. I said it aloud while I cooked for myself. I saw him only once a month, and Miriam and Benji not at all. His eyelids were turning purple. And the month Rocky got accepted to Milwaukee, March, he showed up on my doorstep reeking of liquor and piss, his head shaved down to the grain. I rubbed the fine, downy layer of fur that was left. It made his eyes look enormous. When the first fingers of dawn were peeking through the mountains, he'd leave drive two and a half hours home to his son, pulsing with weed and meat. All right, last up on the list here is Lee Glansman with Mapmaker's Daughter and So Many. Yay, love being last. You can all escape, but I'm done. Um, so this first poem actually was just accepted for publication. So um, okay, so the Matt Nigger's daughter. I had built all these boats when my father called me to the top of the lighthouse. You are old enough now, he said, as I crab clawed those last few stairs, my land legs pink and watery as fresh speared squid. He led me to the razor-rusted railing, his father's father's telescope, a brass barrel with a glass eye. It's not for stars, he said, because everything ends. The sky steeped red, our legs hung free. My father whistled through his chapped lips, and I wept until I slept at the top of the wind-whipped walls, and the ocean sipped me a teacup of tears. Look out across the sea, my father whispered when I woke. The curve of the earth, no sharp corners, the whole world waterfalling and falling, a kettle of squall and storm. On nights like these, don't count the stars. Like shells or songs or sunrises, the stars outnumber grief. All those boats, driftwood mass, seaweed sails barely afloat, tangled up at the dock and the tide using them as drums. My father leapt from the grooved metal widow's walk, sailing through the air like a dolphin, Diving between reef and sand like a gull, belly first, his back broken in the shape of an oil grease rainbow, creaking like a hull. I climbed down the staircase and bled the length of the shore, strung his skeleton with a rope and swung aboard, plucked his tongue like a harp, thrum, thrum, thrum. Uh, this next one is from a series that I'm writing, and it's uh, a series where I uh, kind of redo some uh, like old mythological tales. So if anybody knows like what a Umiyo or a Kitsune is, that's what this is about. So it's like a vampiric siren in the East. Which, okay. It's called So Many. One, on Earth there are so many trees. The air, bright and blue and blistering. I have no name. I rise from my den in the afternoon, drink from the creek, the taste sweet as the cooling belly of a star, wander beneath the tall pine and above the white-bottomed river, lick the snow. An eagle stitches through the sky, lovely and brown as the moment before sunset. I am the oldest of Carmo's hundred daughters. All the forests and forest trails are mine. When my mother is sad, she gives me another tale. For so many, many days, I have just the one. Two. The cities bloom among my mountains like rot. Roads scrawling through my trees, the land flayed open for fruit, and the wind burdened with burning and brine. In the mud-worn streets, the songs worn of my beauty, and my nine white tails, and my eyes bright as teeth. They name me Fox Spirit and hunt me like an animal. I am not an animal. Three. I have so many bodies, and men want to destroy them all. The roads, once tracks, scratches strafing through my trees, now wounds across the mountain face, dark 
beaten scars I can't erase. Four, they hunt me in my forest. I hunt them on their roads. In the shape of a woman, I itch. The silk of my gown woven from the atoms of my tails abrades my shoulders and thighs. Another winter falling through my forests. These men falling at my feet. They dismount in moonlight sharp enough to dance in and beg to smell my skin, slide inside me. I'm a merciful God, sometimes. When I moan, the sweet, dark taste of him burns my tongue, delectable even after the so, so many I've had. Usually I only eat the liver, but his eyes are hot and full black, so I swallow those too. All right, so I think we should give, uh, give another hand to all of our readers tonight. And then, I'm just going to make you keep clapping more. Let's give another hand to EXO for hosting the MFA. All right, uh, I think we have some snacks around, and obviously some beer and cider available to us. Um, and we have this room from my understanding for like another hour. So, yeah. So let's hang out, have a good time. Thank you all for coming tonight. Just hold me